Thank you for viewing our educational videos on micromanufacturing with lasers. In part one, Dr. Ronald Schaefer, CEO of Photo Machining, presented the advantages of using lasers in micromachining and the characteristics of the lasers commonly employed in industrial applications, such as pulse repetition rate, pulse duration, and wavelength. In part two, we will learn about the laser type starting with an explanation of why we should use UV lasers. Over to you, Ron. Why should we use UV lasers? Well, the wavelength of a UV laser is very short, below 400 nanometers, typically between about 150 nanometers to 400 nanometers. The pulse duration is also short because of the way that these lasers are made. The pulse duration is generally less than 100 nanoseconds and a lot less for some of the lasers. And because of the fact that we've got high energy per pulse and short pulse duration, the peak power in these UV lasers is very high, usually more than a kilowatt and sometimes up to several megawatts. The short wavelength allows for photon material interaction within a very small absorption depth. So the photons only travel a short distance into the material before they eject material. Also because of the fact that we're using UV photons, physics tells us we can get a smaller spot size with otherwise identical optical setups. So we can get the smallest feature sizes with UV light. Finally, UV photons have enough photon energy in many cases to break uh, chemical bonds rather than burn chemical bonds. This next graph depicts a chart of some of the available UV lasers. You'll see the lasers that are designated as 157 nanometer, 248 nanometer, uh, 308 nanometer. These are excimer lasers. Excimer lasers have very high energy per pulse, very um, high multi-mode beams that are not Gaussian but are more um, rectangular. However, they do have very high peak powers, up to the 10 megawatts and more. If we look at things like normal DPSS lasers with nanosecond pulse length, we find that they've got um, lower energy per pulse, but the repetition rate is much higher. So the peak power in the DPSS lasers is not as high, unless you get to the picosecond or femtosecond regime, as you can see on the last line. Okay, so why should we use infrared lasers? Infrared lasers have a long wavelength, one micron or greater. A long pulse duration, for instance, the CO2 laser can have milliseconds or usually microseconds pulse length. And these lasers are available in power levels anywhere from one to two watts all the way up to several tens of kilowatts. So there's a large range of output powers that are commercially available. The long wavelength allows us to have a photon material interaction with high absorption depth. Okay, that means that the photons go further into the material before they affect uh, a material ejection. Now this has two consequences. First of all, it means that we can have a higher speed because you're injecting more material. But the second thing is that we lose some of the control because we lose some of the finesse that we see with UV lasers. Also because these infrared lasers are available in such high power outputs, we can get larger feature sizes on target if needed. Because they're infrared lasers, it's always a thermal material removal process. It's always a thermal joining process if you're doing welding. And it's always a thermal deposition process. So infrared lasers work on heat. So let's look at the light bulbs themselves. We've talked about the UV lasers and the infrared lasers. Now let's look at some specific kinds. And I'd like to focus on CO2 lasers, neodymium YAG lasers, excimer and other UV lasers, fiber lasers, and short pulse lasers, which in this case, short pulse we define as less than one nanosecond. So carbon dioxide lasers, the most common laser in the industry, they're fairly inexpensive on a dollars per photon basis. They're, they have a emission frequency between about 9.4 and 11 microns. And within this uh, range, you see several emission lines. So a broadband CO2 laser will have all of these emission lines. We can all, we also line narrow these lasers to get one or the other of the emission lines enhanced. And typically this is done with either the 9.3 line, which is a very good line for uh, processing plastics such as Kapton, or the 10.6 line, which is very good for processing ceramics. Get a fairly high penetration depth, so we're looking at, you know, tens to even of hundreds of microns per pulse. The machining is a thermal process. 
Most of these lasers are used in a focal point machining. So they're a Gaussian beam, we focus it down to a spot, and we do the processing. With the exception of CO2T lasers, which have longitudinal electrodes, and they're used in an imaging mode. And finally, because these are red lasers, inert gas is sometimes used to limit the oxidation in the process area. Um, it isn't specifically said here, but there are some times when oxygen is used to enhance the oxidation. So the, the real message is that many times these lasers use some kind of a gas assist for whatever reason. So the smallest spot size that you can get with a CO2 laser is approximately 75 microns. Now in principle you can get a smaller spot size, but this is in an industrial environment with normal optics. Uh, you get large penetration depths, like I said, faster but less control. It's very efficient laser, about 27% wall plug efficiency, compared to an eczema, for instance, that has about 2%. They're very easy to use, they're robust, they're relatively cheap, um, they last a long time, the optics generally last a long time, um, and there are a lot of different kinds of CO2 lasers available. The other very well-known laser, the infrared laser is the neodymium YAG laser. Uh, they're also very common in the industry. These lasers have been around for a, a long time. They come in a very large range of output powers. And they work on the principle of citing neodymium 3 plus ions in some kind of a host matrix. The most common host matrix is a YAG, yttrium aluminum garnet. So the neodymium YAG lasers are quite familiar and common. But we also have other kinds of lasers. For instance, we have vanadate lasers um, and glass lasers and other kinds that just have essentially the same neodymium 3 plus ions as an active medium, but the host uh, species is somewhat different. The other really good thing about the neodymium YAG lasers is because of the output power and the way it's outputted, you can focus these, the output or the fundamental output into a frequency doubling crystal and get a different wavelength out. So for instance, if you start with one micron radiation and frequency double it, you can get 532 nanometers and that's right in the green portion of the visible spectrum. If you frequency triple it, you can get 355 nanometers, which is in the UV. And if you quadruple it, you can get 266 nanometers, which is also in the UV. And this is the basic principle behind the ultraviolet DPSS lasers. So fiber lasers. Fiber lasers have really only been on the commercial scene for about the last uh, 12, 15 years. They were really pushed in the industrial sector after massive amounts of money were spent in the telecom sector, developing them for telecom. They have incredibly long lifetimes, very highly reliable, very low maintenance, very low cost of ownership and operation, um, very good beam quality. There's no th thermal lensing as you see in YAG lasers. Right now, these lasers are dominant in all the metal cutting industries. So for instance, stents, uh, flatbed cutters, that sort of thing. They're really gaining a lot of market share in welding. YAG lasers are probably still the predominant force, but fiber lasers are quickly overtaking them. And fiber lasers are generally in the infrared, although new fiber lasers are coming out that uh, will allow you to go to the green portion of the spectrum. Perhaps in, sh in a few months or years, we'll be able to go into the UV portion of the spectrum. And also fiber lasers are being used for um, seeds for ultra short pulse lasers too. So let's get into ultra short pulse lasers. Short is a relative term, so let's assume that we mean that the lasers have a pulse length of less than one nanosecond. Uh, it includes picosecond and femtosecond lasers. Um, there are potentially applications where you could even get a shorter pulse laser, but the problem becomes that the optics are very difficult to deal with when you get below about 150 femtoseconds. So even though right now 10 femtosecond lasers are commercially available on the market, there generally doesn't seem to be any appeal to go down to that short of a pulse length because of all the other problems associated with the optics. And in general, we've found that at below about 150 femtoseconds, you don't really gain anything with respect to edge quality or anything like that. And so we say the 150 femtoseconds right now is probably the lower limit on the pulse length that we'd use for a laser. Because of the short pulse length, even with low energy per pulse, we get very high peak powers.
and peak power intensity is still the key. So a peak power laser is really good, but if you have too big of a spot size, you're not going to have the uh, energy density in that spot. So you want a peak power intensity, which means high energy per pulse, which means short pulse, and which means small spot size. All these three things give you high peak power intensity. So if you have this high peak power intensity, what do you get? What are the advantages? Some of the advantages of ultra short pulse lasers, which are picosecond and femtosecond again, uh, number one, they open up a whole new range of applications which you probably couldn't access with other lasers. Um, number two, that if you get short enough in pulse length, you get predominantly independent or wavelength independent absorption, even in otherwise transparent materials. So we have found, for instance, that uh, we can use a, a femtosecond green laser on glass where normally green light goes right through the glass. But if we use a short enough pulse length, we can use green light to actually ablate glass. It's a basically non-thermal first order interaction and ablation. There's virtually no heat affected zone and no micro cracks. And this technology is developing and moving quite quickly. So I'd like to give you an example so that we can easily understand what we mean by this whole business of short pulse lasers. So let's assume we have a one picosecond laser. And in order for us to comprehend this, let's transpose the coordinate system so that we say a picosecond corresponds to a second. If we're also assuming that we're running at 100 kilohertz, that's 100,000 pulses per second, OK? That means that each pulse comes one over 100 thousandths of a second in time which sounds like a very short amount of time, but compared to a picosecond, we'll see it's not that short. All right, so if a picosecond is transposed to one second, then what's the interval between pulses? And the way I like to demonstrate this is if you close your eyes, open them for one second, in other words, blink, and then close them again. How long do you have to wait before you open them again for one second? Okay, in this case, the answer is four months. So if we have a one picosecond laser running at 100 kilohertz and transpose a coordinate system, we open our eyes for one second, and for four months, we close our eyes. So the point being that we get a very, very large burst of high intensity light in a very short amount of time, and then we get nothing for a long period of time. So there's enough time for a lot of the molecular relaxation and so on to go on. If we actually look at a 100 femtosecond laser, and say 100 femtoseconds is a second, then we don't open our eyes for another 3.5 years. And if we run at 10 kilohertz instead of 100 kilohertz, we actually open our eyes for one second and keep our eyes closed for 35 years. Pretty interesting. Now last May, I went around to the uh, Laser Munich show, which is the biggest laser show in the world, and I asked a number of uh, vendors of these short pulse lasers to give me their specifications so that I can tabulate it. And here we see in table one the tabulation of the picosecond laser manufacturers as of May 2013. Um, this table is actually already superseded because many of these uh, companies are going to be showing their new products which in general most of these new products are going to higher power and higher power and of course lower cost. So the femtosecond lasers and the picosecond lasers where five years ago you probably only had a half a dozen companies in the world making these devices for commercial applications, now you've probably got a couple dozen. Everybody's jumping into the short pulse world and they're doing it for a reason because there's a lot of uh, applications here. Thank you for viewing laser types used in micromanufacturing. In part three, Ron will present actual industrial applications, such as drilling, cutting, thin film patterning, laser welding and marking, and some unique applications, such as laser additive manufacturing. Visit photomachining.com for more information. Thank you.